friends. I've been watching the Tour de France that's been going on the last couple of weeks, and if you've been paying any attention, you know in one of the early stages, a Velomobile showed up. It was a Red Quest Velomobile that was having no problem keeping up with the Peloton. I got to thinking, what would happen if Velomobiles were allowed in the Tour de France? Could we win? So I thought, okay, let's crunch some numbers. So I've gone to the Kreuzotter website that uh, has programmed in the uh, the CDA, the the uh, measurement of the how aerodynamic something is for road bikes uh, versus uh, a quest. So let's let's take a look at this. Let's say we've got an average Tour de France rider air temperature around 800 and maybe 1100 feet above sea level with a slight wind going 90 rpm and just for the sake of this let's say they're doing 350 watts some of the riders are putting out more and some are putting out less but uh, let's say they've got a, a 16 pound bike which is pretty average on a zero percent gradient they're going to be doing around 22.8 miles an hour if they're out on their own and not in the peloton. Now if they go to 3%, that goes down to 16.9, 5%, 13.7, 8%, 10.3, and 12.7, 12.5 uh, miles an hour. Now let's put them in a Velomobile and let's say instead of a Quest that it's more like a super light snook around 40 pounds. Um, the CDA is calculated for a quest. It would be a little bit better in something like a snook, but this isn't real world, it's just maths. So let's see what we come up with. At a 0% gradient, the Velomobile is going to be going a whopping 34 miles an hour. That's about 11 miles an hour faster than the bike. It's a pretty big advantage. But let's start upping the gradient. At 3%, they're down to 19.1, so you've only got an advantage of uh, maybe 2 miles an hour. 5%, that's down to 13.7, which is the same as the road bike. I'm a little skeptical that a Velomobile with, at 350 watts is really going to go 13.7 miles an hour, but then I can't put out 350 watts, so who knows? Let's say we up that to an 8% gradient. <clears throat> now the Velomobile is going 9.3 miles an hour, which is a mile an hour slower. And then as we get into the 12% gradients, we're going uh, even more than a mile an hour slower. And again, when we're getting up in that gradient, I'm skeptical about, about how real world uh, application we're actually looking at with this calculator. Because here's the thing, when you get to double percentage gradients, a lot of the weight in a Velomobile is up in the front between the front wheels, and you're going to start to lose traction in the back. And uh, let's take, for instance, the La Planche de Belfi climb. Uh, a lot of that climb was on gravel, and this was one of the early stages in France. And it was really interesting to watch as they were getting up towards the top and they were getting tired. Those guys were struggling to get the bike even moving, a Velomobile in that kind of gradient isn't going to make it. The, uh, the top time this year uh, was a kind of a tie between Louis Meinkies and Sepp Kuss. Sepp Kuss averaged 373 watts for a time of 1526 and an average of 12.7 miles an hour. I would love to see a Velomobile try to go up La Planche de Buffy at 373 watts and see if they can come anywhere close to 12.7 miles an hour. My guess is they're probably going to have to get out and push. Now let's look at some other climbs. Let's look at the Alpe d'Huez. The Alpe d'Huez is uh, 7.62 miles, elevation gain of 3,461 feet with an average gradient of 8.6%. There's a lot of really tight hairpins on this too. The uh, top time this year again with Sepp Kuss, again with an average of 373 watts. That guy is uh, very consistent in his climbing wattage. And he came out at 12.7 miles an hour, 
which is also the speed that he climbed the uh, Planche de Belfi at. And that took him three, uh, 36 minutes. I don't think a Velomobile can get up Alpe d'Huez in 36 minutes with an average gradient of 8.6%. So even though that whole stage um, wasn't entirely just that climb, I don't look like I pulled that one up. No. But uh, let's take the uh, Planche de Belfi ride and take a look at that. It's just a one long climb for the first 65 miles. Then there's some up and down with this huge climb here at the end. A, a Velomobile might be able to keep up and maybe even get a little bit ahead here, but I don't think you're going to get far enough ahead to make up for the up and down and then that really steep up at the end. Now, where could a Velomobile maybe win? Well, maybe something like this stage here in Denmark. I think this was maybe the second day. And this one is much more flat. I wouldn't say it's necessarily completely fat because it was 3,839 feet of elevation gain. But uh, compared to the one with the Planche de Belfi at the end, that was 8,325 feet around um, a similar mileage. So on this kind of thing, there's enough short ups and downs that a Velomobile could get some pretty good uh, speed that they could carry through and they might have a chance of getting up some of these climbs without slowing down too much. Now, I'm talking mainly here about single riders, but I ran across an interesting study because I said, you know, what impact does riding in the peloton have? Well, somebody actually did a study on it, and I will link to this study in the description. They found through um, aerodynamic testing and crunching the numbers in a computer, these numbers about the impact of riding in a group. The rider out here in the front is putting about 86% effort in. But look at what happens once you get back into this circle area. They only have to put about 9% of the effort of a single rider. And when you get back in here, they've only got to put out 5% of the effort of a single rider. So the rider that goes in the breakaway has got to put out, you know, obviously 100% effort. These guys back here are just taking a Sunday cruise. And if you're one of the leaders in the race, they usually aim to try to be in here, the yellow jersey wearer, because you're not as likely to get caught out uh, in a wreck. And because look at how much less power you've got to put out and you can save all of that energy for the end. Now, yes, a Velomobile is much more aerodynamic. As we saw with the 0% gradient, the Velomobile rider is going 11 miles an hour or so faster for 350 watts. But these guys back here are putting out even less wattage than the Velomobile rider would need to put out. So let's go back to the, this estimator and let's say we're on a 0% gradient again. And let's go with the road biker. And let's say that road biker is going for an average speed of 28 miles an hour. They'll average that much easily and probably more than that on a 0% gradient. But let's see what wattage a solo rider's doing. Solo rider's doing 589 watts, which is pretty huge. Whereas the, uh, I gotta change the weight here is only doing 224 watts to get that same mile per hour. However, that's about 50% of the effort. When we look back at this study, these guys are doing 10% or less effort, which is much lower wattage. So they're gonna be much more rested when they get to the end, which means a Velomobile in a breakaway is gonna have an advantage, but the winner of the Tour de France is not usually in the breakaway. 
they're usually sitting back there behind their domestiques resting up so that they can sprint at the end and, and hit that last climb at a really good high wattage pace because, you know, they've been resting for most of the 120 some mile ride. Now, maybe you're thinking, well, we can make up the time on the descents. No, not necessarily. Because if you look at those descents, they're very, very curving serpentine descents. For instance, if you were coming down the Alpe d'Huez, which we're not, but look at the, the number of hairpins. And any time you get up to a top of a, of, a, of a steep climb, if you're gonna go down the other side in a fairly steep climb, they're mostly going to be very twisty turning climbs or descents because you wanna to try to keep that road from getting too steep just for the sake of the brakes on the automobile and also for the bikes. So we're gonna to have to slow down on those curves. And that means that we're not gonna be able to build up that huge speed advantage that we have. In fact, it's very possible that a Velomobile on a twisty turny descent is gonna end up getting to the bottom later than the road bike because the road biker can bank. We also need to keep in mind that these races are gonna end usually with either a sprint or a climb. On the climb, we've established that the poor Velomobile rider has a huge disadvantage. On a sprint, we're also at a disadvantage because we're heavier and because we can't use our body weight to swing the bike back and forth and to stop on the pedals. We can push back into the seat, but people that I've talked to have said that they found they have as much as 20% power loss between a road bike and a recumbent. And that's gonna put us again at a big disadvantage. And even though we have the aerodynamic advantage, if that, uh, that last bit is any sort of climb, we're gonna to start to lose that disadvantage aerodynamically. So, is there any point in the, in the Tour de France where a Velomobile could win? Yeah, maybe. We might have an advantage on something like the course in Denmark where it was shorter and where the uphill and downhills are, are close enough together and short enough that we could carry our momentum from the downhill into the next uphill and, and maybe make it over the top before we slow down too much and get caught up. And especially if it had a, a nice flat ending, then we might have a chance. We also might do well in a TT in the time trials because we're not using a Peloton. And if that course didn't have too sharp of turns where we'd need to slow down so we don't lift a wheel or end up you know tipping over, we could probably win a time trial because we are so much more aerodynamic. Now, when you put all of it together, could we win the Tour de France? I don't think so. There's just too much climbing. Does that mean that Velomobiles are an inferior type of bike? No, it just means that we have different pluses and minuses than road bikes. And the Tour de France is not a race that's structured in a way that would be good for a Velomobile to show off its advantage. The Velomobile is great for something like Battle Mountain where we're going straight full out on the flat and trying to get the highest speed we possibly can. So should we say, well, then the Tour de France is a bad race? Oh, of course not. It's just a race that's designed for road bikes and where road bikes can really excel. And Velomobiles are great for what they are, for just normal riding, when you're riding on the road, maybe, or you're trying to mix it up with traffic in a commuting situation, or you ride someplace where you've got a lot of wet, cold weather, like England or Minnesota, where a large part of the year is not a really great time of the year to be out on, on a standard bike. So I say, enjoy the Tour de France for what it is. These guys are amazing athletes doing some really incredible, powerful, all-out efforts. And it's fun to, to see what a road bike is capable of and to watch them work in the peloton to use the aerodynamic advantage that the road bike has.